Hey, what's up? Let's get straight into it. How to make a simple animation in Blender 2.8. This is Blender's default interface. This is the default cube. It's an object inside your scene. Objects have a lot of different properties, some of which can be found in the object panel. For example, location, rotation and scale are properties. This down here is Blender's timeline. It consists of different frames you can scrub through by clicking and dragging on this dark header. The very basic idea of a 3D animation is to have different stuff happen in different frames, and then rendering out a video file that plays those frames back in order, at the rate of 25 frames per second, for example. Let's quickly make a very simple animation for the default cube, and I'll then explain in more detail what we did. Go to frame 1 and select the cube. Go to the properties and click this little dot next to the Z location property to set a keyframe. Then go to frame 25 and move the cube up a bit. Set the keyframe again. Go to frame 50 and type 0 in the Z location property to get the cube exactly in the same place as it was in the beginning. This time I'll show a different way to set the keyframe by pressing I while the mouse is in the 3D viewport and then location. You can see that it automatically created all three location keyframes. Currently this animation is 250 frames long, but our animated action here lasts only 50 frames. So set the end point to 50 and play back the animation to see what we got. It moves up and down and then loops back to the beginning every time the animation reaches the end. So what we did here was we first told Blender what location we want the cube to be in at three different frames. A keyframe in Blender is just a marker of a specific frame that stores a specific value of a specific property. Then Blender takes those keyframes and automatically interpolates smooth motions for all the in-between frames. You can see the interpolation by going to the graph editor. You can see that the Z location graph has these smooth transitions between the keyframes, which are these dots with the handles. You can move these keyframes around to fine-tune the animation, or change the interpolation mode from here. Almost all editable values in Blender are animatable, meaning that you can set keyframes to them and so have them change over time. Keyframes are stored in an action, that's another important term. You can see the action of an object by switching to the dope sheet and selecting action editor from here. So here we have the cube action that Blender automatically created when we added the first keyframe. So let's add a new object in here. As you can see, it doesn't have an action linked to it yet, like this cube has this cube action with these keyframes. But let's say I want to scale this sphere from 0 to 1 and back to 0, something like that. When I add the first keyframe, a new action is automatically created. You can also create new actions manually, of course, but an object can only have one action at a time linked to it. Well, you can kind of have multiple actions influencing an object with these NLA strips, and the object's mesh can also have actions linked to it, but we won't worry about those right now. So the cool thing about actions is that if you, for example, want to test out a different kind of movement for the cube, you don't have to delete this action. You can just press this button to tell Blender not to delete this action even if it doesn't have users, and then unlink it from the cube. And then you can just animate it again. Here I'm also using rotation keyframes. And when you're done, you can switch between the actions, just by selecting them from this dropdown. You can even set the sphere action for the cube. You can also have many objects use the same action. And if you need to, for example, tweak the animation, it updates for all the objects, which is very handy. All of this action linking and NLA stuff becomes more relevant once you start to have character rigs or more complex scenes where there's lots of same types of things happening in different places and times. But I think it's very good to understand the underlying system at least a little bit, even when starting out with this simpler stuff. So those are the very basics of animation in Blender. A couple more things if you want to recreate the text animation from the beginning. Blender has a separate object type for texts. In edit mode you can write, and in the text data here you can add some depth to the characters and play with these other values as well. And then to get all these characters to be separate objects, you can right click and convert to mesh, go to edit mode, select all, alt M to merge by distance, P to separate by loose parts, go back to object mode, shade flat, 
and then set origin to geometry. And now all these characters are separate objects that you can animate however you like. And with that information it really just becomes a matter of adding some text objects to the scene and separating them, and then starting to add some keyframes basically. Of course there's much more efficient ways of doing specifically this sort of thing, with drivers and animation nodes, but I just want to show that with these basic tools you can already make some very nice looking things. And by the way, when you start to have many objects with different animations in your scene, it's useful to switch to the dope sheet editor, because there you can see all the different objects' keyframes at the same time. I made the lines around the 2.8 number from a simple circle, and then converted it to a curve, so that I could animate the bevel start and end values. And the underline under the word animation is also a Bezier curve, with the same animated bevel values. Then I just set up a basic material and lighting setup with the EV renderer, and rendered out the sequence. To render a video file you can copy these settings to the output properties and then from up here render animation. Okay the tutorial part is now over, I hope you learned something, and now I invite you to our standard philosophical contemplation moment. I've often thought about very dark art and the difficulties I have with interpreting the meanings behind it. On one hand it's clear that art should be a tool to discuss all aspects of life, and that there's a lot of very beautiful art that approaches the darker themes in a good way. But on the other hand, a lot of the dark art that I come across feels like it's not done right. The other day I realized that it might have to do with the attitude towards the darkness, that I often find difficult. Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about how problems are not really real, that there's situations that might require handling, but there's never problems. The idea is that problems are just a concept made up by the mind, and they are not to be wallowed in. According to him, the correct thing to do is to first decide an appropriate course of action, and then accept everything, and appreciate the present moment, to not identify with the negative things in your life, to not identify with suffering, but instead to just encounter the suffering without judgment, without attachment. That made me realize that the kind of dark art that I don't find empowering or constructive often feels to me like it identifies with the suffering, meaning that it takes it personally and sort of wallows in it. And conversely, the kind of dark art that I find healing and right feels like it just encounters and observes the darkness and suffering in a healthy way, in a gracious way, without judgment and without diving so deep into it that the light on the other end disappears. This of course has just as much to do with how the consumer of the art feels about it than the art itself. The same piece of art can produce very different responses in different people. I think a good way to address darkness in art is a way that always leaves a line of sight to brightness.